on page 225 from inside of a dog. Back then to the matter of the autobiographical memory. In many ways, dogs act as if they think about their memories as the personal story of their life. They sometimes act as though they are thinking about their own future. Unless sick or asleep, there was usually nothing that could stop Pumpernickel from eating dog biscuits. And yet, she often refrained when home alone, opting to wait for my return. Even when accompanied, dogs regularly hide bones and squirrel away other favored treats. A toy may be abandoned outside with seeming insolence, only to be blind for the next week. Their actions can often be traced to events of their own past. They remember and avoid ground that was rough underfoot. Dogs who turned suddenly gruff. People who acted erratically or cruelly. And they invent familiarity with create creatures and objects they encounter repeatedly. Besides their quick recognition of their new owners, Young dogs come to know their owner's visitors over time. They play best and with the least ceremony with those dogs they have known the longest, as though they are stamped together. These long-time playmates need not use elaborate play signals with each other. They use their own shorthand, signals abbreviated into mere flashes before fully engaging. Asterisk. This is similar to what has been on to on to genetic ritualization the co-shaping by individuals of a behavior over time until even the very initial part of the behavior carries meaning for them in humans an eyebrow raised from one friend to another can take the place of a spoken commentary as we've seen among dogs a quick head raise might replace an entire play bow it is somewhat dispiriting to find that our knowledge about a dog's autobiographical sense has not advanced beyond Snoopy's affirmation half a century ago. Yesterday I was a dog. Today I am a dog. Tomorrow I'll probably still be a dog. No experimental study has specifically tested the dog's consideration of his own past or future, but a few studies with other animals examine part of what might be considered their autobiographical consciousness. For instance, a test run on the western scrub jay, a bird that naturally catches food for later consumption, has shown what in humans would be called willpower. If I'm hankering for chocolate chip cookies and someone gives me a bag of chocolate chip cookies, it is extremely unlikely that I would put them away until the next day. The jays were taught that when given a preferred food, their chocolate chip cookie equivalent, they would not be given food on the subsequent morning. Despite what we can presume is a strong interest in eating the food straight away, they saved some and consumed it the next day, and me without my cookies. We might ask whether dogs act similarly. If prevented from eating in the morning, does your dog begin to stash food the night before? If so, that would be suggestive evidence that they can plan for the future. As we know from finding uneaten, unidentifiables in refrigerated takeout containers, not all saved food is equally good over time. If your dog buries a bone in the dirt or in the corner of the couch each month for three months, does he remember which is the oldest, the foulest, and which is the freshest? Putting aside any overpowering odors emanating from your couch, it is not likely. If we consider the dog's environment, it is apparent that they simply do not need to use time in this way as they, unlike scrub jays, are provided with a regular supply of food. In addition, discriminating food by its expiration date or saving food for later when you're hungry now may be a difficult task for an animal descended 
from opportunistic feeders who eat as much as they can when food is available, then endure long stretches of fasting when food is not. Some suggest reasonably that dogs' bone burying behavior is tied to an ancestral urge to stash some food aside for the lean times, asterisk, which some wolves instinctively do. Even as young cubs, they bury their noses into a patch of land, drop a bone, nose burrow some more, then proudly leave their poor excuse of a hole with the bone obviously visible. As adults, they refine the behavior and do retrieve cached food, although there is no data about whether the retrieval is time sensitive. Evidence that a dog can distinguish the fresh bone from the one that has rotted or leaves some aside just to enjoy it later would bear this out. It is more likely that most of the time dogs are not thinking about time when they are thinking about food. A bone is a bone is a bone buried or in the mouth. On the other hand, a dearth of evidence verifying dogs time telling with bones does not mean that dogs do not distinguish past from present from future. When encountering a dog who had once but only once been aggressive, the dog will first be wary and gradually with time grow more emboldened. And dogs certainly anticipate what is in their near future with growing excitement on beginning the walk that leads to the dog food store or anxiety at the car ride that suggests a visit to the veterinarian. Some thinkers treat the dog as having no past, as, invi as inviably ahistorical, happy because they cannot remember, but it is clear that they are happy even despite remembering. We don't yet know if there is an eye there behind the dog's eyes, a sense of self of being a dog. Perhaps there need only be a continuous teller for the autobiography to be written. In that case, they are writing it now in front of you. Good dog, about right and wrong. When Pumpernickel was a young dog, a common scene in our household went like this. I turn my back or I go into another room. Milliseconds later, Pumpernickel has her nose at the kitchen trash can, peering in for good bits. If I return and catch her in this vulnerable spot, she immediately pulls her nose out of the can, her ears and tail drop, and she wags excitedly, slinking away, caught. When researchers asked a sample of dog owners what kinds of things dogs know or understand about our world, the owners most frequently claimed that dogs know when they have done something wrong, that dogs have not have knowledge of a kind of category of things one must never ever do. These days that category includes things like tearing into the garbage, devouring footwear, and snatching just cooked food off the kitchen counter. Punishment is our enlightened, in our enlightened ages, one hopes not terribly severe. A stern word, a frown, and a stamped foot. It was not always so. In the Middle Ages and earlier, Dogs and other animals were brutally punished for misdeeds, from the progressive mutilation of the ears, feet, and onto the tail of the dog in correspondence with the number of people he had bitten, to the capital punishment of the legal trial and conviction of a dog for homicide. Asterisk. The medieval policy seems ridiculous to presume that dogs merit lawful consideration. It may seem equally ridiculous that our modern policy presumes that dogs do not. We still kill dogs who mortally wound a human, but now we call the dogs dangerous and do not bother to put them on trial, though their owners might be tried. Earlier in Rome, the ritual crucifixion of a dog on every anniversary of the evening, the Gauls attacked the capital and a dog failed to warn of their approach. The guilty look of a dog responsible for lesser trespasses is well known to anyone who has caught a dog in Pumpernickel's pose with her snout deeply plunged into the trash can or discovered with bits of stuffing in his mouth and surrounded by tufts of what had until recently been the innards of the couch. 
ears pulled back and pressed down against the head, tail wagging in quick time and tucked between the legs, and trying to sneak out of the room. The dog gives every appearance of realizing that he's been caught red pawed. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You're a trash getting dog. The empirical question that raises is not whether this guilty look reliably occurs in such settings. It does. Instead, the question is what it is exactly about those settings that prompts the look. It may, in fact, be guilt, or it may be something else. The excitement of sniffing the trash, a reaction to being discovered, or anticipation of the unhappy loud noises her owner tends to make when encountering trash out of its can. Can dogs know right from wrong? Do they know that this particular action is clearly maddingly wrong? A few years back, a Doberman employed to guard an expensive teddy bear collection including Elvis Presley's favorite bear, was discovered in the morning with the devastation of hundreds of maimed, mauled, and beheaded teddies around him. His look, captured in news photos, was not of a dog who thought he had done wrong. It would seem to defy reason if the mechanism behind the guilty or the defiant look were the same as ours. After all, right and wrong are concepts that we humans have by virtue of being raised in a culture that has defined such things. Accepting young children and psychotics, every person winds up knowing right from wrong. We grow up in a world of oughts and oughts nots, learning some rules for conduct explicitly and others by a kind of observational osmosis. But consider how we know that other people know right from wrong when they cannot tell us so. A two-year-old sidles up to a table, gropes toward an expensive vase, and knocks it over, shattering it. Does the child know that it was wrong to break things that belong to other people? This might be an occasion on which, given the probable explosive reaction from any adults in the vicinity, she begins to learn. But at age two, she does not yet understand the concepts. She did not maliciously destroy the vase. Instead, she is an ordinary two-year-old who is clumsily trying to master moving her own body. We get an indication of her intent by watching what she did before and after the vase fell. Did she head directly for the vase and act to push it over? Or was she reaching for the vase and was uncoordinated in doing so? After it fell, did she evince surprise? Or did she look, well, satisfied? Essentially, the same method can be applied to dogs by allowing them to break expensive vases and watching how they react. I designed an experiment to determine if those guilty looks come from being guilty or from one of the something else's. Through my method, though my method is experimental, the setting is ordinary so as to best capture the animal's natural behavior in the wild of their own homes. To qualify for subjecthood, dogs had to have been exposed to an owner's disallowance. For instance, by the owner pointing at an object to be left alone and loudly stating no, and must know to therefore leave it be. Asterisk. The command varies from owner to owner, from no to the recently popular leave it, each is fundamentally a negation, a sharp sounding grammatical flourish that can be applied co concurrently to any behavior to make it off limits. In the place of expensive vases, I use highly desirable treats, a bit of a biscuit, a cube of cheese that will not be shattered, but will be expressly forbidden. Given that the claim being tested is that a dog knows that engaging in a behavior that has been disallowed by the owner is wrong. I designed this experiment to provide an opportunity to do that very behavior. 
In this case, the owner is asked to bring the dog's attention to the treat and then clearly tell the dog not to eat it. The treat is placed in an enticingly available spot. Then the owner leaves the room. Remaining in the room are the dog, the treat, and a quietly observing video camera. Here's the dog's chance to do the wrong thing. What the dogs do is only the beginning of the data for our experiment. In most cases, we assume that if given the opportunity, the dog's first move is to get the treat. We wait until he does. Then the owner returns. Here is the crucial data. How does a dog behave? Every psychologist and biological experiment is designed to control one or more variables while leaving the rest of the world unchanged. A variable can be anything. Ingestion of a drug, exposure to a sound, presentation with a set of words. The idea is simply that if this variable is important, the subject's behavior will be changed when exposed to it. In my experiment, there are two variables. Whether the dog eats the treat, the one owners are most interested in, and whether the owner knows whether the dog has eaten it, the one I guess the dogs are most interested in. Over a handful of trials, I alternate these variables one at a time. First, the opportunity to eat the treat is varied, either removing the treat after the owner leaves, providing the dog the treat, or letting the dog stew over it and eventually disobey. What we tell the owner of the dog's behavior is also varied. In one trial, the dog eats the treat and the owner is informed on return to the room. In another, the dog is serendipitously given the treat by the videographer and the owner is misled into thinking that the dog has disobeyed, has obeyed the command not to eat. All the dogs survive the experiment, looking well fed and a little bewildered. In many of the trials, the dogs could be models for the guilty look. They lower their gaze, press their ears back, slump their body, and shyly avert their head. Numerous tails beat a rapid rhythm low between their legs. Some raise a paw in appeasement or flick their tongue out nervously. But these guilt-related behaviors did not occur more often in the trials when the dogs had disobeyed than in those when they had obeyed. Instead, there were more guilty looks in the trials when the owner scolded the dog, whether the dog had disobeyed or not. Being scolded, despite resisting the disallowed treat, led to an extra guilty look. This indicates that the dog has associated the owner, not the act, with an imminent reprimand. What's happening here? The dog is anticipating punishment around certain objects or when seeing the subtle cues from the owner that indicate he may be angry. As we know, dogs readily learn to notice associations between events. If the appearance of food follows the opening of the large cold box in the kitchen, why? The dog will be alert to the opening of that box. These associations can be forged with events of their making as well as those they observe. Much of what is learned is based deep down on making associations. Whining is followed by attention, so the dog learns to whine for attention. Scratching at the trash can causes it to tip and spill its contents, so the dog learns to scratch to get what's inside. And making certain kinds of messes is sometimes followed much later by the presence of the owner, which is itself quickly followed by the reddening of the owner's face, loud verbiage coming out of the owner, and punishment by that reddened loud owner. The key here is that the mere appearance of the owner around what looks like evidence of destruction can be enough to convince the dog that punishment is imminent. The owner's arrival is much more closely linked to punishment than the garbage emptying the dog engaged in hours earlier. And if that's the case, most dogs will assume a submissive posture on seeing their owners. The classic guilty look. In this case, a claim about the dog's knowledge of his misdeed is importantly off the mark. The dog may not think of the behavior as bad. The guilty look is very similar to the look of fear and to submissive behaviors. 
It is no surprise then to find so many dog owners who are frustrated with attempts to punish a dog for bad behavior. When the dog clearly knows is, an is to anticipate punishment when the owner appears wearing a look of displeasure. What the dog does not know is that he is guilty. He just knows to look out for you. A lack of guilt does not mean dogs do nothing wrong. They not only do plenty of human-defined wrong things, they sometimes seem to flaunt these things. A half-chewed shoe is paraded in front of a busy owner. You are greeted by a dog merrily exhausted from rolling in defecation. The teddy bear guard dog looked nothing if not proud when photographed surrounded by the teddy bear remains. Dogs do seem to play with the fact of our knowing and not knowing something to get attention, which it generally does, and perhaps just for the sake of playing with knowledge. This is not unlike a child testing the limits of his understanding of the physical world by sitting on his high chair, dropping a cup to the floor, and again and again, he is seeing what happens. Dogs do this with different states of attention, knowledge, or alertness of their owners. In this way, they come to learn more about what we know, which they can use to their advantage. In particular, dogs are quite capable of concealing behavior, acting to deflect attention from their true motives. Given what we know about their understanding of mind, it is entirely within their reach to deceive. And given that it is a rudimentary understanding, their deception is not always very good. This too is childlike, as in the two-year-old child who puts his hands over his eyes to hide from a parent. Part way to hiding, but not quite getting the essence of hidden. Dogs show both imaginative insights and inadequacies. They do not work to hide the spoils of an overturned trash can or a messy roll in the grass, but they do act in ways to conceal their true intent, to stretch forward idly next to a dog playing with a treasured toy, only to get close enough to snatch it, to shriek overly dramatically when bitten in play, thereby ending a momentary disadvantage as the playmate stops in shock. These behaviors may be fortuitously with accidental actions that turn out to yield happy consequences. Once noticed, they will be produced again and again. It only remains now for, a, for an experimenter to provide an opportunity for dogs to intentionally deceive one another, unless they are too clever to let their scheming be revealed. A dog's age about emergencies and death. With age, she uses her eyes less. She looks at me less. With age, she would rather stand than walk, lie than stand. And so she lies next to me, outside with her head between her legs, nose still alert to the smells on the breeze. With age, she has become more stubborn, insisting on hoisting herself upstairs without help. With age, the difference is amplified between her day mood, reluctant to walk, extra sniffy, and her evening mood, pulling me out the door, a spring in her step, willing to forsake smells for a jaunty tour around the block. With age, I have been given a gift. The details of Pumpernickel's existence have become even more alive. I started seeing the geography of smells she checks up on in the neighborhood. I feel how long are the periods she waits for me. I hear the way she speaks volumes by simply standing. I see her efforts to cooperate when I goad her to trot across the street. Every dog that you name and bring home will also die. This inescapable, dreadful fact is part of our lot for introducing dogs into our lives. What is less certain is whether our dog themselves have any inkling of their own mortality. I inspect Pumpernickel for any sign that she notices the age of her sniff mates on the sidewalks, notes the appearance, disappearance of the old droopy-eared fella with the cloudy eyes from down the block, observes her own slowed and stiffed gait, graying fur, and lethargic mood.
It is our grasp of the fragility of our own existence that makes us worry of risking undertakings. Cautious for ourselves and those we love, our mortal knowledge may not be visible in all of our moves, but it shines through in some. We shrink back from the balcony's edge, from the animals with unknown intent. We buckle up for safety. We look both ways before crossing. We don't jump in the tiger cage. We refrain from the third serving of fried ice cream. We even entertain not swimming after eating. If dogs know about death, it might show in how they act. I would prefer that dogs not know. On the one hand, when I have been confronted with a dying dog, I wanted to be able to explain to her her situation, as though an explanation would be a comfort. On the other, despite many owners' habit of giving explanations to their dogs for every command or event, come on, I overhear regularly in the park, we've got to go home so Mama can get to work. Dogs do not seem comforted by explanations. A life untrammeled by knowledge of its end is an in, in, inviable life. There are a few indications that we should not envy them much. One comes from their own balcony aversion. For the most part, dogs reflectively withdraw from true danger, be it a high ledge, a rushing river, or an animal with a predatory gleam in its eye. They act to avoid death. So does the low paramecium beating a hasty retreat from predators and toxic substances. Avoidance behavior is instinctual, seen in some form in nearly all organisms. Instincts, from the knee jerk to an eye blink, do not require that the animal understands what is, it is doing. And we are not ready to grant the paramecium an understanding of death. But that reflex is not trivial. A more sophisticated understanding could be bootstrapped onto it. And here are two ways dogs differ from the paramecium. First, they are not only avoidant of injury, they act differently once injured. They are aware of when they are damaged. Hurt or dying dogs often make great efforts to move away from their families, canine or human, to settle down and perhaps die someplace safe. Second, they are attentive to the dangers that others put themselves in. One need not wait long for a story of a heroic dog to pop up in the local news. A child lost in the mountains is kept alive by the warmth of dogs who stayed with him. A man who falls through the ice from a frozen lake is saved by a dog who came to him at the ice's edge. A dog's barking attracts a boy's parents before he can reach into the hull of a poisonous snake. Heroic dog tales abound. My friend and colleague, Mark Beckoff, a biologist who has studied animals for 40 years, writes of a blind Labrador retriever named Norman, who was roused to action by the screams of the family's children, caught in the current of a raging river. Joey had managed to reach the shore, but his sister was struggling, making no headway and in great distress. Norman jumped straight in and swam after Lisa. When he reached her, she grabbed his tail and together they headed for safety. The end result of all the dog's actions is clear. Someone was able to avert death for another day. Given that the dogs needed to overcome their own instinct of self-preservation to preserve another self, the usual interpretation is that the dogs are heroic, not inadvertent actors. An understanding of the dire straits faced by the various humans might seem the only explanation, but the trouble with anecdotes is that one does not have the full story of what happened, since the teller, with his own umbelt and particular perception, is necessarily restricted in what he sees. One could reasonably ask whether Norman did not as much intend to save Lisa as, say, follow her brother's instruction to swim out to her. Or maybe at least herself was able to swim to shore on seeing her faithful companion near. Or maybe the current shifted and carried her to shore. There is no videotape to rewind and examine to carefully consider what happened here or in any of the rescues described. Nor do we know the long-term behavior of the dogs. It is, one of, it is one thing if a dog suddenly barks in order to alert others that a boy is imperiled. It is another if that dog is barking all the time day and night. 
an understanding of the dog's life histories is also important to correct inter to correctly interpret what happened. Finally, what of all the cases when a dog didn't save the drowning child with a lost hiker? The newspaper headlines never crow. Lost woman dies after dog fails to find and drag her to safety. If the heroic dogs are taken to represent the species, so should the non-heroes be given consideration. There are certainly more unreported non-heroic acts than there is reported heroism. Both the skeptical and the heroic talk can be displaced by a more powerful explanation, wrought by looking more closely at the dog's behavior. Scrutiny of these dog stories reveal a recurring element. The dog came toward his owner or stayed close to the person in distress. The warmth of a dog saves a lost, cold child. A man in a frozen lake can grab onto his dog waiting on the ice. In some cases, the dog also created a ruckus, barking, running around. calling attention to himself and to save the venomous snake. These elements, proximity to the owner and attention getting behavior are by now familiar to us as characteristics of dogs and go into their being such fine companions for humans. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you.